Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I never knew where my grandpa got the nickname Stone Cold. Some said it was from his time serving in Vietnam, while others claimed he earned it by facing down the mafia in Cincinnati. But what I knew to be true about him was that he had an otherworldly steel demeanor and piercing eyes that seemed to look right through you. I remember one winter day in Oklahoma, when my grandpa asked me to chop firewood ahead of a snowstorm. We spent the entire day working together, chopping wood and talking. As we worked, he told me stories about his land and how it abutted against the backside of an Indian reservation. He spoke fondly of the Native Americans who used to come around when he was a kid, but then his mood shifted when he warned me sternly, don't ever get involved with those Native girls. His eyes glazed over as he spoke, and I could tell he was lost in his memories. He began to tell me about a time when he fell in love with a native girl and how she snuck off the reservation with him. Those spirits follow you when you deal with those native women, he said gravely. Suddenly, he switched topic and began to speak about Bigfoot. He claimed that the Bigfoot was a protector of the Native Americans and that he had once seen one himself. His voice grew quiet as he recounted the story of how the creature had stared him down with anger on its face. Years later, when my grandpa was serving in Vietnam, I finally understood why they called him Stone Cold. When I asked him about the worst thing he experienced during the war, he told me a story that made my blood run cold. He spoke matter-of-factly about how he and his platoon had come under fire in the jungle and how many of his fellow soldiers had been killed in ambush. He and four others managed to break away and flank the Viet Cong, but they had to wade through a swamp with water up to their chests. As they worked through the murky water, gunfire crackled in the distance. Finally, they emerged from the swamp and the first thing he saw was a pile of human carcasses. Arms, legs, and torsos were piled up waist high, but there were no heads to be seen. About 45 yards away, my grandpa spotted a Bigfoot, watching them with its massive arms crossed over its chest. One of his fellow soldiers went to shoot at it, but my grandpa stopped him, not wanting to give away their position. They continued flanking the enemy and managed to kill 13 Viet Cong fighters that day. As he told me the story, I could see the pain and trauma etched in my grandpa's eyes. He fell silent for two days afterward, not speaking a word to anyone. But when the storm hit, he was forced out of his mental slump. He sprang into action, barking orders to everyone around the house. Yes, that was my grandpa. They called him Stone Cold Abe. Before he died, he looked at me with those piercing eyes and told me that he loved me and that he was proud of me. Those words have stayed with me ever since. I always wanted to be like him, but I knew deep down that I could never truly emulate the strength and resilience of that remarkable man. On to the next one. I was a typical teenage boy in the summer of 2015, looking for ways to make some extra money. My friends and I had heard about this job called corn detasseling, where we could earn a decent paycheck by working in the fields. It seemed like a great opportunity, so we decided to give it a shot. The work was grueling. The sun beat down on us relentlessly as we trudged through the muddy rows reaching up to grab the tassels and pull them off. The corn leaves scratched at our skin, leaving behind red marks and tiny cuts, sweat 
poured down our faces as we pushed through fatigue, determined to finish each row before moving on to the next. I was just a young boy growing up in the heartland of Iowa. The summer of 2015 was hotter than usual. Never underestimate the humidity that corn gives off. I can tell you with 100% certainty. So this particular summer, I found myself needing extra money for a new bike or even a car. It was hard work, but it paid well and I was determined to save up for something special. One particular day stands out vividly in my memory. It started like any other, with our crew gathering at the crack of dawn to begin our work. We split into teams and headed out to our designated sections of the field. I was paired up with my friend Jake, and together we set off into the sea of corn. As we made our way through the rows, we couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The usual sounds of birds chirping and insects buzzing were eerily absent. The air felt heavy, as if a storm were brewing just beyond the horizon. But we dismissed our unease as mere imagination and continued on. You hear all sorts of strange things in the field. I once saw a deer making a barking noise. I remember laughing with Jake because we both got spooked by it. I was so grateful for having him there. It made the heat-filled days easier to deal with. We usually worked side by side. Hours passed, and the sun climbed higher in the sky. We were nearing the end of our section when we heard a rustling sound coming from behind us. We turned to see a figure emerging from the corn stalks. It was tall and hunched over, with matted fur covering its body. A growl escaped its throat, and I froze, unable to believe what I was seeing ahead of me. Thick muscles rippled beneath the fur as it made eye contact with me. There was a gold flickering in its eyes, almost looked like double pupils. I hit Jake's arm, unable to speak. He looked over at me, saying, what? I pointed at the dog man. He froze alongside me. My heart skipped a beat as I realized what we were facing, the legendary dog man. Stories of this creature had circulated among locals for years, but I'd always dismissed them as mere crazy talk. There would have been some sort of evidence if something like this ever existed. Yet, here it stood before us, its glowing red eyes fixed on our trembling forms. Jake and I froze in fear, unable to tear our gaze away from the menacing creature. Its growls reverberated through the air, sending chills down our spines. We knew we had to get away, but our legs felt like jelly, refusing to obey our frantic commands. The dogman lowered its limbs, working like a cat ready to hunt. Suddenly, the dogman lunged towards us, its claws slashing through the air. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I found the strength to move. I grabbed Jake's arm and we sprinted through the cornfield, desperate to escape the clutches of this terrifying beast. As we ran as fast as our legs could carry us, the sound of our pounding footsteps echoing in our ears, the corn stalks whipped against our faces, leaving scratches and welts in their wake. But we didn't dare look back, fearing that even a momentary glance would seal our fate. Finally, we burst out of the cornfield and stumbled onto a nearby road. We collapsed onto the ground, gasping for breath and thanking whatever higher power had spared us from the dogman's wrath. We knew we had narrowly escaped a gruesome fate. From that day forward, I never looked at the cornfields of Iowa in the same way. The encounter with the dogman had forever changed me leaving me with a lingering sense of unease whenever. On to the next one. The following sightings take place in Lawton, Oklahoma. Mr. Matt Dixon heard something out in the front of his house. In the dark, he caught a glimpse of a vaguely human-like figure near an empty fish pond. Curious, 
Matt decided to find out who the stranger was and stepped out on his front porch for a better look. He was terrified to see a wolf-like man attempting to scoop up puddles of water from the bottom of the fish pond, crouching on its hands and knees. The sight was so shocking that Dixon suffered a heart attack. Dixon reported to the police that it was tall, with a lot of hair all over its face and body, and dressed in an indescribable manner. Around that same time, a creature was seen ripping the legs off a cattle and mutilating animals. Mr. Ron D. and his wife were relaxing for the evening when Jackie realized that she had forgotten to bring in some things from the back porch. When she opened the door and stepped out onto the porch, she realized that she was not alone. In the moonlight, she saw a humanoid creature whose body was covered in fur. The face was a mixture of a wolf and human. Ron D. sprinted to his wife's aid when he heard his wife scream. He was at her side in time to see the wolfman leap over the wooden fence that surrounded their backyard and disappeared into the darkness. It emitted a horrible growling sound as it left. On to the next one. In El Reno in Canadian County in Oklahoma, a hairy humanoid described as a midway between a gorilla and a man was ranging around the area. It was dubbed the Abominable Chicken Man due to its proclivities for raiding hen houses. On to the next one. While I was in high school, it was close to the high school football homecoming because several of the students were at the Dresser's Ranch Barn preparing a homecoming float when several members of the Tallahena, Oklahoma high school football team drove up to the barn yelling and screaming that they had seen something in the woods on Green Hill Road. They even said that whatever it was was bigger than E.S. and grabbed him while he was in the woods using the bathroom. E.S. was a football player and was well over six foot three inches tall and weighed approximately 245 pounds. E.S. would not get out of the truck when they got to the dresser's barn. He was as white as a sheet and seemed to be in some sort of shock. Another football player, E.N., was shaking so bad he couldn't even zip up his own pants. Several of the other football players said they were there when it happened, but didn't see anything except E.S. running back to where the fire was, passing them and locking himself in his truck. E.N. jokingly got his spotlight out of the truck to shine it where E.S. had come from. E.N. was holding the spotlight in one hand and trying to take a leak at the same time. E.N. said he had seen it. A large, hairy animal standing about 20 feet from him? E.S. and E.N. were the only ones to actually see whatever it was, but they were convincing enough that the others that were there jumped in their vehicles and drove to town, which was about five miles away. Since we had one of our teachers at the dresser's barn with us, they came there first. And after they told us what had happened, we thought they were pulling our leg and joking. But once we'd seen the faces of E.S. and E.N., we thought there had to be something to it. So all of us jumped into our cars and trucks and headed out to Green Hill Road to see if we could see anything. Since there was a whole line of cars and trucks going out of town at the same time, the local police saw us and called the highway patrol and county deputy. They thought we were up to no good. Once we got to Green Hill Road, several of us had spotlights and were shining out into the woods where E.S. had been grabbed. We didn't see anything out of place. Then the highway patrol trooper and the county deputy arrived to run us off. They did ask what was going on, so... E.S. and E.N. told them what they had seen. After that, the highway patrol trooper and deputy sheriff went out into the woods to look around. Just a few minutes later, both came back to the waiting group of high school students, told us if we knew what was good for us, we would get out of there. They neither confirmed nor denied seeing anything. We all left and got back to town. At school the next day, the topic of most conversation 
with the Green Hill Monster. After school, we all returned to Green Hill Road to have a look in the daylight. What we found was three deer, necks broken, and their guts ripped out. None of the deer had any bullet holes and were intact except for the gut being ripped out. I also noticed the strange behavior of the law enforcement officers when they came out of the woods after finding the three dead deer with their necks broken the next day. It was on the south side of Green Hill Road, which is cattle pasture, barbed wire fence. On the north side of the road where the incident had happened, it was wooded with a dead end turnoff, where kids usually go to party. On to the next one. My family and I were driving home early in the morning between 2 and 3 a.m. It was very dark with very little moonlight. We took a shortcut down Highway 63, which runs between Haleyville, Oklahoma, and Kiowa, Oklahoma. The highway is now paved, but at the time of our encounter, it was a well-maintained dirt road. The road had many curves and hills. We were traveling around 40 to 50 miles per hour. We crossed over a hill, and right below the hill was a small bridge. On this bridge was a creature that was standing to the right of our pickup as we passed by. The creature was between six to seven feet tall and had brown, shaggy hair all over, similar to an Irish setter dog. As we passed, I looked at the creature right in the face. His face resembled that of an old man, more human than ape-like. I could see that the creature's face had wrinkles and very little hair around its eyes and nose. The creature had no neck, and it looked as if its head was just flopped up on his shoulders. I felt like we surprised the creature, and once he finally saw us, he had nowhere to go. I remember seeing him stand real stiff against the bridge's railing as we passed. I asked my mother to turn around and see if we could get a better look at this mysterious creature. She replied, no way. I asked her what she thought we saw. She replied, I guess it was a bear. I felt that it looked more like a man. She said that it was way too big to be a man. At the time of this incident, I had never heard of such a thing as a Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Although we only got a quick glimpse of this creature, it couldn't have been an illusion. We all felt that we saw the same thing. There were five witnesses involved, my mother, two brothers, sister, and myself, driving down the road and going home. It was hilly, and it was a heavily wooded area. The encounter happened while crossing over a small bridge that covered a small creek. My older brother is an accomplished trapper. He's also an outstanding woodsman. He lives in the Broken Bow, Oklahoma area. While scouting for bobcat tracks, he claimed to have had an encounter. On to the next one. My two children and I were returning from Atlas, Oklahoma to Burns Flat, Oklahoma. In the fall, when a very large, black, man-like creature crossed the highway, moving from west to east. I was driving and my son, who was 11, was sitting in the front seat beside me and my daughter, who was 12, was sitting in the back seat, leaning forward between the driver and passenger seat. It was a clear, sunny day at about 3 p.m. and there was a lull in conversation. It was quiet in the car. We did not have the radio on and all three of us happened to be looking straight ahead. I noticed a movement on the left side of the road and was amazed to see what I perceived to be a very large, black, man-like creature rise from a squatting position and run across the two-lane highway about 30 yards ahead. The creature crossed from one cattle pasture to another. It may have been leaving a pond on the east side of the highway. It ran across the highway, covering the distance in only three steps. I estimate the creature to have been at least eight feet tall. It glanced briefly in the direction of the car, and I instinctively applied the brakes so as to not hit it. It ran into the bar ditch on the east side of the road and ducked into some brush and larger bushes between the ditch and the barbed wire fence. It had hair that looked rather silky as it ran. I remember seeing the hair move as it ran. The hair did not appear to be stiff like an animal's hair, but more soft 
and shiny. Both children saw it too and said, What was that, Mama? <laughs> I said, I don't know. They wanted me to stop the car, but I was frightened that my children and I could be harmed by something I had never seen before in my life. I didn't tell anyone what I had seen and cautioned my children not to say anything either. I remember thinking that the pavement would be hot on its bare feet and that it was the reason why it had crossed the road so quickly. The weather was clear, sunny, and hot at around 3 p.m. It was a barbed wire fence cattle pasture, mostly grassy, but with a few trees and bushes. On to the next one. The following are a collection of wild man accounts from the turn of the century, which share a striking resemblance to modern day Bigfoot sighting. Consternation reigns among the women folk and some of the men in the wild around Oakland, caused by the appearance of a supposedly crazy man during the past week. The man, who has been described as unkempt with long hair, has been seen several times, and his actions are such as to cause considerable uneasiness among those sojourning at the summer resort. People who came down from the canyons this morning confirmed the report. It is said that the man made his appearance about a week ago. He first made his appearance at night by creeping up to different cottages, and he was evidently searching for food. When an attempt was made to capture him, he fled with the speed of a deer and would remain in hiding, only making his appearance again when forced to by hunger. Some two weeks ago, a man with a long black beard, dressed in a very shabby fashion, was seen at the mouth of Green Canyon leading into Mill Creek Canyon, about ten miles from Oak Glen, where he has been seen lately. The queer character has, on several occasions, crept cautiously up behind women and stood there, making no attempt, however, at doing harm, but succeeding in causing the women to run and scream. I believe that the man is an escaped patient from Patton. Local officers have been notified. From the paper, Redlands Review, reports from Oak Glen are to the effect that a wild man, or perhaps a crazy man, or maybe a little bit of both, is lurking in the jungles and wilds in that vicinity and naturally the women folk are afraid to go out to the well to get a pail of water now it seems that the only real trouble with the man is that he is always hungry it is said that the man made his first appearance about a week ago he is described as having long matted beard long hair and a generally wild appearance and few clothes some of the most daring even suggest that he is dressed only in what nature allows him and not according to the provisions and letter of the law. It seems that the fellow has not offered violence to anyone, but has been seen eating banana peels and other trash left by campers. The theory is that he is an escaped lunatic. The dispatches yesterday tell of the sheriff and ten deputy sheriffs armed with guns and carrying ropes searching the wilds around Devil's Canyon in San Bernardino, California, for a naked wild man with long hair and whiskers, who has terrorized the campers in that satanic section. Down in southern Oregon, a gang of speculated wise acres are camping in the woods waiting for a naked man to get through doing the Nebuchadnezzar stunt and to come out of the pristine forest covered with barks, furs, or anything else he can find to hide under. The one is pronounced crazy. Another Ishi, aboriginal inhabitant of the North American content, has been located in the wilds of Deer Creek, according to George Bushwell of Chico, who returned here today from a trip in the wild country. He declares he found the tracks of the aborigine two miles from the place where Ishii, the child of nature who startled scientists of the University of California, was found. 
Bushwell declared he is convinced that another wild man, similar in habits to Ishii, now inhabits the almost impregnable fastness along Deer Creek. His tracks were found in the soft red dirt of that region, and they are so large as to indicate a man of immense size, Bushwell says. Search parties started out today from Chico in an effort to locate the wild man. The shaggy orangutan in Poe's murders in the Rue Morgue could have been no more horrifying in appearance than the man or beast who at three o'clock on a recent morning invaded the bedroom of two small girls in Long Beach. The tiny daughters of H. H. Thompson were asleep in their room in the Thompson home when they were awakened by a man in the room. They screamed and huddled under the bedcloth in fear. Thompson, the father, heard the screams and rushed into the room just in time to see the most gorilla-like man he'd ever seen climbing out the window. Before the girl's father could reach the window, the man had dropped to the ground and escaped. Thompson said the man's head and face were so covered with long, black, shaggy hair. With his immense size and ferocious stoop, he in every way resembled a large ape. The father arrived before anything had been stolen. The Long Beach police are hunting for a man of this ape-like description, but so far without success. Excitement ran high southwest of here yesterday following the report by frightened shepherd herders that a nude wild man had been seen running at large in that section. Felix Fagoa, prominent herd owner of that district who brought in the report Thursday, said that a wild figure had been seen through field glasses galloping madly over the hills. Constable R.C. Thompson of Alpog who was notified immediately organized a party, and together with A. Ellis and F. K. Ray conducted a 24-hour search for their man. The party, which was armed with guns and ropes, claimed to have seen the man late Thursday evening, but that he escaped owing to the darkness. The search was abandoned by the constable yesterday afternoon, but shepherders are still searching for the man in the desolate country six miles east of Alpga. Working under the direction of Sheriff Kalkin, a posse yesterday searching the countryside south of here for a scantily clad man who is believed to be demented and who has been seen roaming the highways and darting in and out of the thicket for the last two weeks. The posse will resume the hunt today, the sheriff said. The man thought is said to be harmless and is reported to be able to run with the fleetness of a deer. Yesterday, a deputy sheriff and some tourists tried to catch the fellow, but he outran them and disappeared. He is said to have been dressed in a shirt and beach clout. It is thought that he has a secret camping place in the timber. On to the next one. Irving Razor and Charles Ames of the New Jersey Division of Fish and Game spotted something coming out of the fog in a Sussex County swamp. They both agreed that it was a Bigfoot. On to the next one. In Rutherford in Bergen County in New Jersey, two boys riding bicycles saw a Bigfoot at dusk near a lake. The creature was nine feet tall on the trail ahead of them. They were shaken up pretty bad. The Bigfoot was on the trail ahead of them, and they turned and took flight in the opposite direction. On to the next one. A young man was driving home late one night along Fisher Boulevard in Tom's River in Ocean County in New Jersey when a six-foot-tall, hairy creature jumped out in front of his car. He was badly shaken, but just having passed a police car, he turned around and sped back to the policeman who returned with him to the scene. The policeman, with some nonchalance, directed the young man to stay in the car while he went into the woods with a torch to investigate. It was a short wait. 
the officer ran from the woods in a state of panic and jumped into the young man's car. Though the young man broke speed limits on his way from the scene, there wasn't a murmur of complaint from the passenger. The witness suffered nightmares for weeks afterward. On to the next one. A forest ranger walking along a forest trail in Sussex County saw a creature about eight feet tall with big red eyes. It received the nickname Big Red Eye. On to the next one. Two boys, seven and thirteen years old, were berry picking on the shores of White Meadow Lake in Morris County in New Jersey when they saw an eight-foot-tall hairy monster with red eyes and hands, not paws, which was seen when it was walking into the foliage. Initially, the crouching animal reared up to its full eight-foot height behind a patch of raspberry bushes. Before the boys could react, it took several giant steps and vanished into heavy foliage. The seven-year-old glimpsed the creature's face and claimed that blood was coming out of the eyes. On to the next one. Now, this one might not be a Bigfoot, but it was so weird I had to include it. Two women were out riding horses in the Lakeland area by Blackwood in Gloucester County, New Jersey, when they were chased by a creature which they had first seen 100 feet ahead of them near a junkyard. The area had been unnaturally quiet at the time. The thing was six foot tall, and its back was facing them. Their horses were getting restless. The thing started walking up the path, and the two women followed it, but the horses started to go wild. The thing turned around. It had whitish hair with black spots on its hips. It had horns coming out of its head and red slanted eyes. Its nose had a pig-like snout and it stood on two feet that ended in cloven hoofs. Its hands were tipped with large claws and it looked like it was slobbering all over. It jumped into the path, lowering its head like it was going to charge them. It then did charge them with its arms down by its side and tried to grab one of the horse's tails but missed. When the older witness looked back, it was standing in the spot the two witnesses had been standing in. After the witnesses had gotten away from the thing, they saw a Washington Township police car by the junkyard and told the policeman driving that there was some strange creature in the woods that had gone after them. The policeman said, Well, I hope to hell that we don't catch it. Then the thing appeared in the junkyard and they all saw it hop over an eight-foot fence and run into the woods. After this, the two women took the horses back to the stable. On to the next one. Ron Moorhead and Al Berry made an invaluable contribution to the topic of Bigfoot with their recording of the infamous Sierra sounds, which depict multiple voices speaking with a depth and rapidity that many experts believe humanly impossible. After studying the vocalizations at length, a participant in the fieldwork with Moorhead, retired United States Navy cryptolinguist, Gott Nelson, is convinced of the recording's authenticity. Immediately, I recognized that there was language there, Nelson said, citing morphemes, phonomes, and syntax, indicating intelligent communication. According to Nelson, non-human primates don't have the apparatus to communicate with the articulations that are on Barry Moorhead tapes. Despite the building blocks of language present in the Sierra sounds, those who have heard these vocalizations firsthand commonly describe them as nonsense, gibberish, jabber, chatter, or speaking backward. One bow hunter used the term incoherently intoxicated to describe voices heard in Michigan. Comparisons of Bigfoot vocalizations to backward speech are precedent. 
a variety of medieval witch rituals, including the Black Mass, were purportedly recited backwards. In Germanic folklore, powers of sorcery were unlocked by reading a black book from the devil. Its magical powers were released by reading it forwards and backwards, wrote Rosemary Ellen Guiley. If anyone failed to read the book backwards, the devil was able to take control of him or her. Once activated, the book enabled people to acquire great wealth and do terrible things without punishment. Given the wild man medieval characterization as a demon, this association is unsurprising, but it is interesting to see reflected in modern reports. Researcher, magician, and blogger Ren Collier noted that recordings of alleged Sasquatch speech are reminiscent of barbarous words, language employed in magical rituals. These speech patterns are, from a linguistic standpoint, nonsense, yet still possess a cadence and facade of logic inherent in glossalia, speaking in tongues. Some words are clearly just transliterated Hebrew, sometimes corrupted through copier error, wrote Patrick Dunn in Magic Power Language Symbol, a magician's exploration of linguistics. But many other words are not Hebrew at all or any other language. More likely, these barbarous words are meaningless in a strict sense. They had an inherent strangeness that made them salient and weird. In some spells, the magician even claims to be speaking languages like Persian when he or she is reciting nonsense from our perspective syllables. In folklore, the tongues of both fairies and wild men were commonly unintelligible from anthropologist Roger Barda. The wild man did not have language, but took words by storm in order to express the murmurings of another world, the signals that nature gave to society. The wild man spoke words that did not have literal meaning, but were eloquent in communicating sensation that civilized language could not express. His words were devoid of sense, but expressed feeling. Spencer described this discordance between the expression of natural passion and the articulation of rational language. In Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, a wild man only communicates via gestures and looks because other languages he has none nor speech, but a soft murmur and confused sound of often senseless words which nature did not teach expressed his passion which reason did impeach. This arcane language is also compared to the speech of fairies in both the Old and New World. Circa 86 BC, Roman general Silius was returning after sacking Athens when he encountered a satyr, a fairy with direct ties to the wild man archetype, who uttered nothing intelligible, his accent being harsh and inaccurate something between the neighing of a horse and the bleeding of a goat. According to Ling King Losech, the Yun Wi Sundi, a subset of Cherokee's little people, speak in an ancient Tha Lagi dialect. Some of the elders today can understand this strange dialect and know what they are saying. Some say it is Iladi, a Tha Lagi language now extinct. Loziah adds, the elders say that if you stop and listen to the small voice while in the woods, the voices will sometimes come to you. They will circle all around you with their laughter and singing, their whistling and chanting. You will find them watching you from behind old stumps and rotting logs, peering out from tree branches and piles of leaves. When this happens, they are the ones who decide when and how you leave. You can't run. In his book, The Rebirth of Pan, author Jim Brandon compares this nonsensical jabbering of the Sierra sounds to electronic voice phenomenon EVPs collected in ghost hunting. In these examples, disembodied voices not heard at the time of the recording are audible on playback. To underscore this comparison, Brandon cited the work of one of the leading researchers, the Latvian psychologist Dr. Konstantin Rodiv, who lists 
as typical EVB trait. 1. Multilingual vocabulary. 2. Stilted, often confused grammar. 3. Awkward telegram-like sentences. 4. Use of many neologisms or seemingly made-up words with an otherworldly ring. Disembodied voices in forests are commonplace throughout the folklore. Certain Malaysian traditions whisper of the Orang Buni, or voice folk, whose vocalizations are said to be very similar to the human voice in distress. According to Alexander Porteris, tales are often told of those who, under this impression, have answered the call and proceeded toward the voice, but having once done so, they could not retrace their steps. The unfortunate one is lured further on into the darkness until at last the voice folk become visible to him and his doom is to become one of them and invisible to man, only his voice betokening his presence. This sounds not only like Celtic tales of being pixie-led but alarmingly similar to the Kwa Kudal Bokwas who tries to tempt humans into eating ghost food and therefore becoming bookwas themselves. Occasionally, witnesses liken Bigfoot speech to the cadence of known languages. By far, the most common comparison is Japanese, leading some to dub Sasquatch speech samurai chatter because of its speech and guttural quality. In the late 1980s, a sense of dread fell upon a lone hunter in Sweden Valley, Pennsylvania, just before he heard what he believed were people talking to each other loudly. But what they said made no sense. It sounded like the Japanese language being played backward. Their voices ascended 200 yards up a steep hill in around 15 seconds, and several minutes later, the witness spied a seven-foot-tall figure stepping behind a small cluster of trees from which it never emerged. Keep in mind, these trees were spaced about a foot apart and were maybe eight inches in diameter, he wrote. The odd thing was, you could not see any hair between the trees or movement even through my scope. Others described the vocalizations as similar to indigenous North American languages, Chinese or Russian. In one instance, a professor hiking in the United States stumbled upon two Bigfoot tearing down trees in a forest, jabbering in what he thought was a Siberian dialect unfamiliar to him. Texas resident Zolly Owens spotted Bigfoot on numerous occasions near his cornfield and even reported the creatures which were described as Hebrew or Oriental language sped up like Donald Duck sound. Floridian witnesses found tracks in autumn of 2009 near Escambia River, having a few days earlier heard a low, guttural vocalization that sounded almost like a Native American dialect, only a much lower range than most people would speak in. I have been awakened in the night and heard the Cherokee dialect being spoken outside my home in the mountains, wrote Burnett. Call it ghost sounds or whatever from the past, but I hardly think so. Could it be that the creatures have had enough contact with the Cherokees to understand their language, and they sent me being part Cherokee and are trying to communicate with me? Even if they cannot speak human languages, some tribal lore suggests Sasquatch can at least understand them. It's a common belief among many of the tribes in this area that if you confront a Bigfoot that you should talk to it in your native tongue, tell it to stay calm, then slowly back your way out of the area, wrote Pallades of Indigenous Belief in Northern California. The natives believe that Bigfoot understands their Hoopa language. Sasquatch language remains indecipherable, however. I've played the tapes for, and I mean at real time, and slowed them down for everyone, from colleagues who are native Japanese speakers to Persian to Russian to Native American, Nelson says, the problem with that is that no matter who is listening to it, it picks up bits and pieces that they recognize as part of their own language. Nelson attributes this 
Two, pareidolia are natural tendency to create order out of chaotic patterns. They might have morphemes or phenomes that sound exactly like English or Spanish or Cherokee or Persian or Russian or Arcadian, but there's no way we can, you know, take the language as a whole and say, oh, they're speaking ancient Akkadian. That's impossible. First of all, Akkadian is a dead language. Nobody knows what it sounded like. With the exception of Native American dialects, witnesses compare Bigfoot vocals exclusively to Asian languages. Many researchers believe Bigfoot may be Relict Gigantopithecus, a massive species of Asian ape. While Gigantopithecus seems a poor fit for Bigfoot, it seems much larger, less mobile, and more ape-like than modern reports. It is still entertaining to think large, hairy hominids with their own Asianic language may have migrated to the Americas alongside Homo sapiens via the postulated Bering Land Bridge. If Bigfoot is capable of language, are vocalizations in English mimicry or fluency? A handful of cases suggest the latter. In September 24, 1972 issue of The Daily Colonist, T. W. Patterson reported an Indian hunting and, following a buck, came across an animal he believed to be a big bear. To his astonishment, upon taking aim at the animal, the creature looked up and spoke to him in his own language. The hunter then realized he was staring down a seven-foot-tall, hairy man. Other, more specific examples include, in 1978 Wisconsin, two brothers hunting near Shawano separate. One sees what he believes is a large stump rise up to reveal itself as a Bigfoot. An intense snowstorm begins. The hunter raises his firearm, but he hears a voice say, don't shoot. He becomes partially frozen in time until his brother appears, who has been tracking the creature. Both watch the Bigfoot for a time before fleeing. In 1985 in Washington, a bear-like animal attacks a couple camping in the Greenwater area on July 6th. The eight-foot-tall creature is ugly and smelly with curly brown hair, speaks to them in a high-pitched voice asking their names and whether they have permission to camp. They respond in the affirmative, but the creature tells them to leave immediately and begins pelting them with rocks. In 1991, California... Two hunters leaving Jackson Demonstration State Forest hear loud screams, piking their curiosity. Returning to their hunting site, one witness sees a heavily harried man, eight to nine feet tall, and approaches him at gunpoint. At fifteen feet, the creature makes a weird noise before mouthing no danger and pointing at itself. The hunter lowers his rifle, and the beast walks into the trees. Bigfoot seems incredibly adept at mimicry. In an echo of European wildman tradition, this talent even extends to altering their appearance. While many flesh and blood cryptozoologists believe they can appear as tree stumps, logs, no mean feet, or other stranger accounts, describe Bigfoot fully transforming into other forms altogether. On to the next one. Two men were driving on a country road in Michigan when they were startled when their headlights shone on two figures. The larger one was seven to eight feet tall and appeared to weigh over 500 pounds. The shorter one was around five feet tall, weighing 300 pounds. Both of them were moving up towards the car. The frightened driver backed the car up until he found a place to do a U-turn. On to the next one. Close to a sub-power station near Roscommon in Roscommon County in Michigan. It was about 20 years ago, on M18, just south of the town of Roscommon, at the sub-power station. It happened at about 9 p.m. at night in the fall. I had a friend with me that night, and he saw it too. At the time, we thought it was the Dogman of Roscommon County, but over the years, 
I have been thinking about it, and I now really believe it was a Bigfoot. We were both in my truck driving down the road when it crossed in front of us at 9 p.m. just at dusk. Uh, two, the next one. In Berrien County in Michigan, my dog had come up missing, and I heard him barking far away and kept on calling him. We lived in a very wooded area, so his barking was hard to hear. When I found him, he was on a beaver dam in the middle of a pond. I never told this to anyone, not even my wife. It just seemed so unreal. When I saw my dog, he was looking to his right, and that is when I saw a figure of some seven to eight feet tall. It stood there for what seemed like minutes, but was most likely only seconds. It was very muscular, and I knew what it was and only could be a Bigfoot. It couldn't be, but it had to be. We don't have bears this far south in Michigan. Anyway, it ran off away from me and was gone so fast I even doubted if it was even there in the first place. It was in the dead of winter, and I had a very hard time getting my dog, a German Shepherd, to come off the beaver dam. We walked back to our house, and I never told anyone about this. My wife had seen a cougar cross the road in front of her three days before that, and I teased her about seeing things so, there was no way I was going to tell her this. That is about it. Really nothing else to tell. Thanks for listening. On to the next one. When I was about 12 years old, I was watching my younger cousin while at my grandparents' house. They lived on a country road 489 in Mount Morency County. Anyway... My cousin wanted to go to his house for something, so we got on our bikes to leave for his house, which was about a mile and a half away on an old back road. We were on Granger Road, and I was about half a mile in front of him, and he was screaming for me to wait for him. So, as I was waiting for him, I was on part of the road that was surrounded by forest. Then I heard something crashing through the woods, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw something black, almost a reddish-colored thigh, run out of the woods and take one step into the road and leapt across the rest. It landed on the other side, then hopped over a small fence surrounding someone's property, and then it was gone. I was twelve then, and I'm eighteen now and about six foot two, but this thing was at least two feet taller than I am now, maybe even closer to nine feet, but I'm not sure. Everyone I told laughed and said it was just a bear or something. Not many believed me, but I know a bear can't jump like that, and around here they don't get that big. I noticed some broken trees. I never looked for any footprints, but I'm sure there were some. It was in the early afternoon, a sunny day with almost no cloud. I know of a few sightings that happened about seven or eight miles away from a friend's father. It was just a dirt road going through a pine forest. On to the next one. We were on a fishing trip in the Michigan Upper Peninsula. We had a topographical map and were looking for a lake to catch some bluegill. While driving down a sand road through the forest, in my extended cab pickup, I looked to my left heading west, looking south, and saw, sitting in a tree about 30 to 45 yards into the forest, a young, ape-like creature. It had long, possibly four to five inches, reddish, dark brown to black hair, but had a monkey and humanoid face that was much lighter, not white, but not black like a monkey. It sat on the limb with no visible tail as a human would squat on the ground. It appeared that if standing on the ground, it wouldn't be much over 28 to 30 inches tall. I was driving about 10 miles an hour, so I got a good look. As I drove by, my son asked, Did you see that? I answered in the affirmative, and after another quarter mile, I was able to turn around and go back. 
When we got back to where the incident had taken place, it was gone. I asked my son to point to where he had seen it, and he pointed to the exact same spot I had seen it. I asked him to describe it, and he described the same thing. My father was in the front seat with me and did not see it. He advised that we should report it, but I thought little of it and went on with life as general. My son and I saw it at the same time. My father was in the front seat on the passenger side but did not see it. We were looking for a lake to fish. It was 1 p.m., bright blue skies, lot of sunshine. The area was hardwood and pine forest on the south side of a sand road. Lake and swamp on the north side, hardwood and pine forest further north of the swamp. There had been a sighting about 30 miles south near Escanaba a few years previous. On to the next one. In Monroe County in Michigan, my friend and I were driving back home and we decided to go down the back roads instead of taking the main highway. So, we took Rossonville Road to Newburgh and headed eastbound. We were talking about the upcoming NFL season and what teams looked like the most likely candidates to go to the Super Bowl. Also, how bad the Lions are in comparison to the other teams. As we were driving, we noticed a dark object over by the right side of the road. As we drove closer, we could see that it was covered with reddish dark hair. I turned to my friend and we both said, oh wow, a bear. So we got about 15 to 20 yards from it and I honked the horn and it stood up and turned completely around and looked at us and then turned and walked northbound into the woods on two legs like a human. We both stopped and were in shock and we said, oh my God, what was that? We had both windows partway down on my pickup truck and we could smell an awful odor like rotten eggs. Then, about 30 seconds later, my friend and I both said Bigfoot at the exact same time. The creature was about 7 to 8 feet tall and was very well built. It never made a sound at all. And after about two minutes, we quickly drove off and headed down to Timberth Road and headed on home to Monroe. The area that we saw the creature was in a wooded area mixed with some farmland. The creature headed off to the north. The area to the north is heavily wooded and has swamps up in the stumper area. On to the next one. My Uncle Ted was the sweetest old guy you could ever meet. He really was my great uncle, but we just called him Uncle Ted. He was a retired minister, and he had spent most of his life helping people. Even after he retired, he helped everyone out. Sometimes it was financially, more often emotionally, or in dealing with problems. He met my aunt when she was 17. He was a sailor, quite a bit older than her, maybe in his mid-twenties. And boy, did her parents discourage that relationship. They married when she was 18, and a more dedicated husband you could never ask for. After he got out of the Navy, he went to what they called Bible school, and he became a minister. They had a good marriage, and it lasted over 50 years. After my aunt passed away from heart problems, he was brokenhearted. I don't think he ever recovered. He mourned her and missed her terribly. They had always been together. They did everything together. We all felt so bad for him, and my mom tried to get him to move in with us, but he wouldn't. He didn't want to be a bother. He wouldn't have been a bother. We all enjoyed his company. We wanted to return some of the good he'd done for us and others, but he wanted to stay in his own home. I really didn't blame him but we knew he got terribly lonely. He was in his early 80s when my aunt died. They were always out and about doing things, and now he became a complete homebody. We couldn't get him to go anywhere with us. But one day, while my mom and I were over visiting him, taking him some home-cooked food, 
my mom, who drives the van for the senior center and is always all over town picking people up, remarked that she'd heard from someone that there was a destitute old man living in the bushes out by the power plant. Some kids had seen his camp, and it was a big mass of leaves and twigs, a big nest. He had a bunch of strings tied all over the trees and what looked like a couple of big walking sticks. No one had actually seen him, but once in a while, one of the kids would be riding their bikes and they would get an eerie weird feeling. One time, they got a quick glimpse of the guy. He was very tall and had silver hair. They knew he lived there and he must be very poor. He was also in bad need of a shower as the place smelled kind of rank. This was right up my uncle's alley. He had lost his will to live, but all of a sudden, he became very interested in this vagabond guy. I think this was a case of identification, that's all. My uncle felt sorry for this lonely old guy because he himself was a lonely old guy. My uncle told me later that he had driven over there and scoped it all out, hoping to see the old man. I think it was the first time he'd mentioned going anywhere for many months. I kind of worried about this, as I didn't know what was up, and I sure didn't want anything bad to happen to Uncle Ted. I talked to my mom about it, and then talked to Uncle Ted and made him promise to not go over there alone again. I found out later that he continued going over there, but he took his little terrier dog after that so he wouldn't break his promise and be alone. He started going over there about every day, according to his neighbor, who I later talked to about it. She saw him leave every morning and head that direction, so I assume that's what was going on. She actually asked him one day what was up, as she also wanted to keep an eye on him, as we all did. He told her he was going out for a drive each day, as it made him feel better. When she flat out asked him where he drove to, he said he always started over by the power plant where he had begun taking a sack of groceries to the old homeless man every day. Sometimes he even took him hot cups of tea, he told her. The cups would be returned each day to the drop-off spot, so he knew the guy was enjoying the hot drink. Sometimes the old guy would leave him gifts, things like pretty rocks and carved sticks. The neighbor called my mom, and my mom lit into Uncle Ted, but in a nice way. She talked to him about being alone out there with a complete stranger, and did he have a clue what that old guy was all about? What if he came and knocked him on the head and stole his car or something? Uncle Ted just sat there sheepishly and said if the guy wanted his car that bad, he could have it. Mom threw up her hands and fumed and fussed and ended it all by pleading with my uncle to be very careful. He assured her he would. Well, one blow after another. His little dog died of kidney failure. Now my uncle truly was alone, and he was very attached to that dog. We all wondered about what effect this would have on him, and we tried to get him to adopt another dog, but he wouldn't. He said it wouldn't be fair to the dog to have an old guy like him as an owner, especially since he knew he was going to die soon. This really made my blood run cold. How could he know that? Was he suicidal? We intensified our contact with him. My dad now got involved and went over there every day to check on him, and my mom would call him every evening and talk for a while to try to cheer him up. We were always taking him baked goods and casseroles and things like that, but I suspected that they were going to the old homeless guy. One day after school, I rode my bike over to Uncle Ted's as I did occasionally to say hello. I finally got up the nerve to ask him what he meant by saying what he said. He told me that he had a bad heart, and he knew he was going to just kneel over one of these days. He hadn't meant anything morbid by it, and he encouraged me to not worry, that death was a part of life and he was ready. He then told me, but I know it won't be for a while. I want that old guy out there to reveal himself to me before I die. I want to talk to him and get to know him and see if I can help him out, just like Uncle Ted, postponing his own death to help someone else. So 
he kept going out there every morning, leaving food. I think he was becoming a bit obsessed with it. It had given his life the only meaning it seemed to have, and he craved that. He started going out there in the evenings, sometimes not coming home until well after dark. The neighbor's spy reported back to Mom on all of this, and Mom was livid. She told him, it's bad enough for you to be hobnobbing with a complete stranger who very well could be a mental case, but for you to go out there at night is totally unacceptable. Don't you care that we worry about you? Of course he did, and he said he would stop coming home after dark. From now on, he would be home by late evening at the worst case. And he was true to his word, according to the neighbor's spy. The days wore on, and the old guy refused to reveal himself to Uncle Ted, who had taken to leaving books and even a Bible. These disappeared, though he assumed the old guy was reading them. He also left a couple of L.L. Bean catalogs with a note that indicated that he would buy him whatever he needed, just to mark them and tell him the size. The old guy never did. All he seemed interested in was food. Oh, and a sleeping bag Uncle Ted left him with a couple of pillows. Through all this, the old guy would leave presents, like the rocks and sticks. Uncle Ted then told me he didn't think the guy could read or write, and he sure wanted to help him. He started leaving pictures each day with simple words that associated with the picture. For example, he would leave a picture of an apple with the word apple written on it. He would leave paper and a pen for the guy to use and hopefully write notes back, but he never did. But one day, Uncle Ted found a dead dove lying in the exchange spot. He was horrified and didn't know what to make of it, especially a dove, the symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit, so he left it. It disturbed him, thinking the old guy had killed it. My uncle refused the gift. He wasn't sure what effect this would have on their relationship, what there was of one. He actually didn't go back out there for a couple of days, but then he got to worrying that the guy would be hungry. My mom found out and sent my dad to talk to him. He told Uncle Ted he wanted him to move in with us, and if he refused, we would make the case for his mental stability and force the issue. It was the only way my parents knew to safeguard the old guy. This upset Ted a lot. I know it did. Uncle Ted had now begun leaving notes for the old guy. Dad found one in his car after it was all over, and it basically was begging the old guy to reveal himself so they could talk. Uncle Ted said he knew he could help the guy find a home and peace, if only he would reveal who he was and talk. This theme was repeated several times. One evening, at about 8 p.m., my mom got a call from the neighbor's spy. Uncle Ted's car wasn't home. She hadn't seen him since early afternoon. We'd better come over. My parents went over to his house, but there were no signs of anything, no problems. My mom called the police and sent them out to the old power plant. I think she knew something was terribly wrong and couldn't deal with finding my uncle. She was right. The police found him sitting in his car, hunched over the steering wheel, dead. On the windshield was a note, stuck under the wiper. It was illegible. Whoever wrote it had no idea what coherent handwriting was. It just looked like a scribble. Next to it was a shiny silver cross my uncle must have given the old guy. I knew the old guy had left it there. Maybe after my uncle died. Maybe it was my imagination but it seemed to have a sadness to it. The autopsy said Uncle Ted had died of a heart attack. Later, after it was all said and done, my mom asked me what I thought had happened. I simply said, Mom, Uncle Ted finally had the revelation he'd been wanting, but I don't think he saw what he expected to see. What do you mean, she asked. I think what he was dealing with wasn't human at all, and when he realized that, it scared him and he had a heart attack. She just nodded her head and started crying. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, 
and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!